Our speaker this evening is a priest of the Ukrainian Catholic Eparchy of Chicago. Father David Anderson studied under Father Alexander Schmemann at St. Vladimir Seminary and was ordained to the priesthood in 1983. In addition to serving as a parish priest for 39 years, he has been both a teacher and a translator of patristic and Byzantine liturgical texts. He has presented many classes on liturgy and the church fathers throughout the country. He's presently the Byzantine Rite Chaplain at Wyoming Catholic College and also teaches for our Magdala Apostolate. Please join me in welcoming back to the Institute of Catholic Culture, Father David Anderson. Father, take it away. Thank you very much, Anna, and I greet you all with the joy of this Paschal season. And of course, uh, let's begin our evening by singing the Paschal Troparian. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. Christ is risen, dear brothers and sisters, and we are in that time which the church has always called the crown of the year, the crown of the year. This is the chosen and holy day, but it's not a day of 24 hours. These are the words of St. John of Damascus. Uh, this is the chosen and holy day, the first of the week, Feast of Feasts, Festival of Festivals, on which on this day we bless Christ forever, forever. So it's a day that is the vehicle of forever. And I sometimes uh, become, oh, a little concerned when, when people uh, speak of this time as the post Paschal time. It's not a post anything time. It's the presence of the greatest of the church's seasons, that for which Lent and Holy Week has prepared us for. Sometimes I think that there is a danger of getting so wound up in the preparation that preparation becomes an end in itself. And what it has prepared us for is sometimes not as obvious as it should be. Uh, another way of saying this, this, this is my, my particular way of saying it now, is that it is a much greater challenge to feast than to fast. Fasting is for the minor leagues. Feasting is for the majors. <laughs> so I suggest all of you, whether priests and, and faithful, that you immerse yourself in the liturgical prayer of this season as, as fully as you can, and not think of it as some sort of denouement of anything, but rather the presence in time of eternity. And therefore, I look very much forward this evening to speaking on St. Ephraim's Hymns on Paradise, uh, for which I have never given an organized talk before. So I, I'm always glad when I have the opportunity to do something for the first time, because it allows for some uh, new, new thinking, new considering, perhaps some originality, though not originality for its own sake. But I'm very glad to be with you for this presentation. So St. Ephraim's Hymns on Paradise. Uh, we, I think we must begin with three considerations. St. Ephraim, hymns, and paradise. So who is St. Ephraim? St. Ephraim of Syria, or sometimes he's called St. Ephraim the Syrian. And he is a fourth century figure, squarely fourth century, 
the date of his death is known. Uh, uh, 373 is the year that the, the calendar date is, is a bit disputed. But 373 is the year. The day of his birth is not so well known. The place where he lived was for uh, most of his life until the last decade or so in the city of Nisibis. Nisibis. Uh, this would be uh, today, I think, in southeastern Turkey, Nisibis. But at the time when St. Ephraim lived in the fourth century, it was a frontier border city on the, on the eastern front of the Roman Empire. And of course, in the fourth century, you have the ongoing conflict between the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire that had gone on for centuries before, even before there was a Roman Empire, then it was between the Persians and the Greeks. And it will continue to go on for some time after the fourth century. So that's important uh, to understand St. Ephraim because much of what happened to him was a result of this uh, ongoing conflict between Rome and Persia. And because uh, when St. Ephraim was, had lived three quarters of his life, uh, Nisibus was ceded by the Romans to the Persians as part of a peace treaty agreement. And then the Persians insisted that the entire Christian population of Nisibus leave. So they mostly went about 100 miles west to Edessa, Edessa, uh, which in, in, on modern maps would be Urfa. Edessa had been a center of Christian life for some time before the fourth century. And even to the point of the stories that are told, we have to call them stories on the one hand, but on the other hand, that doesn't mean there isn't any history in them. But in the earliest collection of, of documents outside the New Testament that we have, we ha there is this mysterious letter, uh, communication, an exchange of letters that uh, supposedly went on between King Abgar the sixth of Edessa and our Lord Jesus Christ. That uh, Edessa was uh, ruled itself. It, it acknowledged some sort of place of the Roman Empire, but it was not ruled by Rome. It was ruled by its own king. And King Abgar had some sort of serious disease and he had heard rumors of the miracle working Jesus of Nazareth. So it is said that he sent the, actually the, the text of this communication is extant, whether it is genuine or not, historians will debate continually. But he sent this communication saying that uh, he has heard that how many people have been healed by Jesus, and no one could do that, says Abgar, unless he came from God. So then Abgar goes on to say, and then I hear that your own people are trying to, are, are persecuting you. And that, then he becomes almost childlike and says, why don't you come here? There's, there's room here for the both of us. <laughs> and, and I will treat you very well. <laughs> and then uh, it is said that our Lord sent a reply to him saying that, my hour has nearly come, referring to the hour of his passion, a death and resurrection. But when I am risen and ascended to my father, I will send you one of my disciples. And there begins the history of the Christian church in, in Edessa in Syria with the coming of the, of the disciple Adai, which is the Aramaic, the Syriac for, for the Latinized Thaddeus. So Adai comes to Edessa, uh, King Abgar is healed. It's even said that Adai brings a mysterious image with, with him, the image of our Lord Jesus Christ, not made with hands. Some have equated that with the present Shroud of Turin, another fascinating 
fascinating subject. But that all, uh, this, this is just by means of illustration, that all is meant to make, make clear that the Christians of Nisibis, once, it, once the Persians drove them out, uh, went to Edessa to live, and that was a place of very active Christian life. Uh, and however, while in Nisibis, Ephraim, had, had, who was born of a Christian family, in one of the rare biographical uh, statements that he makes, and there are not many of them in his works, uh, in, this is one of his hymns against the heresies that's quoted in, in the introduction to his hymns, uh, the translation that is made by Sebastian Brock. Uh, but this is, these are Ephraim's words. These two things belong to our Lord, the time when I was to enter into the created world and when it will be beneficial for me to leave it. I was born in the path of truth even though my childhood was unaware. But once I grew aware, I, ac I acquired it in the furnace. The crooked paths that I came across did my faith spurn, for they led to the position on the left, because I have acknowledged you, Lord, do you acknowledge me and have compassion on this sinner who has believed in you. So uh, Ephraim grows up a Christian, is ordained to the diaconate, is not ordained ever as a priest or a bishop, uh, is a catechist in the church of Nisibis. Often he is spoken of later as a monk, but that is uh, perhaps a little uh, after, after the fact, because in fact, in fourth century Syria, monasticism was just on the very beginning of, of developing in any kind of organized sort of way. Uh, monasticism, organized monasticism, as we might call it, of course, begins in Egypt with St. Anthony and those with him. And then it takes some time to spread to Palestine, to, to Syria, and then, and then finally to uh, Asia Minor on the West. So there was not any monastery for St. Ephraim to live in, although he did live an ascetic life. We might uh, uh, rather call him an ascetic rather than as a monk in the later sense. So after going from Nisibis to Edessa and, and Ephraim begins to write many of his hymns in Nisibis, that leads us to our second observation, uh, hymns, hymns. We take hymns for granted now in the church. But in the fourth century, there weren't many hymns. There were the Psalms, of course. They, they are, uh, sometimes people call the Psalms hymns, and there's some justification to do that. But when I use the word hymn, I mean a uniquely Christian composition. An, an original Christian composition. And they were few and far between in the fourth century. The fourth century, that watershed history that, that witnesses so much development in the church, everything from the end of the persecutions and therefore the beginning of the first public place, the building of the first public places of worship, often under imperial patronage, uh, for the Christians, the churches, the holy places in Jerusalem and the Holy Land and in Rome and other places that Constantine and Helen are the patrons of. Uh, the great theological crisis coming from the heresy of Arius two days ago, one day ago, well, two liturgical days ago. May 2nd, we all in the Universal Church celebrated the Feast of St. Athanasius the Great. And uh, he, who interestingly died the same year as St. Ephraim, 373. So uh, the articulation of the Nicene Creed, the beginning of, mon of, mon of monasticism as an organized phenomenon, as I mentioned. And also we can add to that from the fourth century comes so many developments in the liturgy, Holy Week that we've just celebrated, uh, is a fourth century institution. And then finally, the singing of hymns. So up until that time, Christians followed the Jewish practice 
of using the Psalter, using the Psalms as hymns, and they may also have used certain New Testament texts, particularly uh, those that are from the Gospels, the Gospel of Luke in particular, the Benedictus, the Magnificat, the, the, uh, he, the Prayer of St. Simeon, which is sometimes called the Hymn of St. Simeon, the Nunc Dimittis in, in Latin. Uh, certainly as the daily cycle of services, the divine office uh, began to converge and coagulate uh, these, these scriptural New Testament texts are, are found everywhere. And that would indicate that they probably had a, a much earlier history of use also in Christian worship. But in terms of non-scriptural texts of hymnody, uh, at the beginning of the fourth century, the only two that we know of for sure are uh, what would be called in the Latin tradition, the Gloria, or in the, the Eastern tradition, the great doxology the, the, in, in the Greek tradition. Uh, it's basically the same hymn in Greek, somewhat longer. It's the same text as the Gloria in Excelsis, but in the Greek form, there's some psalm verses that come at the end of it that make it a little longer. So, but, but the, the original uh, Christian text is, is virtually the same in Greek and Latin. And then you have in the, in the Greek tradition, the evening hymn, the Phos Ilaron, or joyful light, a hymn to, to Christ, the light of the world, to be sung at evening worship. And that, there may have been others, but that seems to be pretty much it as far as liturgical texts of hymnody. So when we say St. Ephraim's hymns, we're talking about a phenomenon of which he really is the fountainhead. And what a fountain it is. There's huge numbers of these hymns composed in Syriac or, or uh, Aramaic. The two languages are, are related. There are variations of each other. So the same language that was adopted by the Jewish population in Palestine some centuries before Christ, when after the destruction of the temple, Hebrew uh, as a spoken language had sort of fallen into disuse, uh, much like Latin as a spoken language did in Western Europe, fell into disuse or, or developed into the, the modern uh, Latin-based or Romance languages. So uh, in the language of Syria, Palestine, uh, St. Ephraim composes these hymns. Now, these hymns make St. Ephraim uh, a father of the church. He is considered one of the church fathers. He's considered a doctor of the church in the Latin tradition. So, and it's, and it's particularly for this hymnody. Now, the fact that it takes the form of hymnody is significant because St. Ephraim is neither Greek nor Latin in his background. Therefore, his approach to the mysteries of God, which he provides words to be the vehicles of their manifestation in the church, are not primarily through dogmatic formulas, not primarily through uh, speculative or philosophical analyses, as, as is found in a good deal of Greek theology, but they are rather uh, contemplative expressions in a form that is not completely dependent upon the intellect. Uh, now, one would not go to the opposite extreme and say that they don't engage the intellect, they certainly do. But they are not intended exclusively to speak to the mind. They rather are directed to, to the whole person, the heart, the spirit, and the body. The whole person is engaged uh, in these hymns. So then thirdly, by, by means of introduction, we are looking at one uh, group of those hymns, 
the hymns on paradise. There are 15 of them. That's a rather small a cluster compared to some of, of St. Ephraim's longer, longer groups of hymns. Paradise, paradise. Uh, in order to appreciate what St. Ephraim is speaking of, we first perhaps would be helped by considering what paradise is not in the way St. Ephraim uh, expresses it in his hymnody. Uh, St. Paradise, or St. Paradise, Paradise, Paradise is not some disembodied state to which we go after we die. Not only is it not that for St. Ephraim, it's not that in the Holy Scriptures either. This comes from uh, what I would have to call an unfortunate Platonization. Uh, the either deliberate or otherwise tendency to marginalize the material, to treat the body as something temporary and discardable, to, and this is perhaps the most alarming thing to say about it, to spiritualize, and, and that's a, a really a bad choice of, of word, but I cannot think of another one to use in its place, to spiritualize the resurrection to the point where it isn't really a resurrection anymore. To replace what all the creeds of the church express, that we await the resurrection of the dead and the life of the age to come, or to use the Latin Apostles' Creed, I believe in the resurrection of the body and life everlasting, uh, to replace that with, even though uh, many who do this would not admit to, that this is what they're doing, but in effect it is, uh, to replace that with, I believe in dying and going to heaven. I believe in life after death existence after death, some, some kind of survival of death. Uh, American religiosity, what's left of it, has been characterized as believing in some sort of supreme being and in some sort of survival of death. Well, this is not the Christianity of the gospel and certainly not the Christianity of St. Ephraim. And the paradise he speaks of is not some dematerialized heaven. In fact, the way he speaks of it in the hymns is quite the contrary. On the, on the one hand, on the one hand, but just as in order to enter fully into the mystery of the resurrection, it's necessary to avoid two erroneous extremes. One is uh, already St. Paul was facing this with his fractious Corinthians, who were claiming, because as, as Greek converts to the Christian faith, uh, it did not come easily to them to believe in the resurrection of the body. And so they had a tendency to describe the resurrection as something that you experienced in the soul or in the spirit. Uh, that's why there's things said in the New Testament about those who claim that the resurrection is past, who instead of speaking clearly about the resurrection of the body, say that, oh, the resurrection means the, the, the uh, rising of the spirit to union with God uh, in me, uh, rather than the, the literal, if I may say, resurrection. So that's, that's one extreme to be avoided, the, the false spiritualization of the resurrection. But on the other hand, we have to avoid the other extreme of a, a crude or gross understanding of the resurrection, which simply uh, sees the resurrection as some sort of continuation of what we have uh, now uh, in, in this part of our lives. Uh, and that is equally as harmful uh, as one of my 
one of my New Testament professors once said in speaking of avoiding of these two extremes, uh, one, one does not speak of, of uh, cutting one's fingernails or blowing one's nose in the resurrection body or of other things as well. Uh, for example, the Lord in the gospel when uh, addressing the Sadducees who denied the resurrection and, and used a, uh, a, a, we might call it, a, it's rather silly, but, but also a gross story of of the, the woman who is taken by seven brothers in succession following the law of Moses. Each one dies, leaving no children, so the next one's got to marry her. And, and they ask Jesus, well, who's she going to be in the resurrection? And Jesus' answer to them is very telling. He says, you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For in, in the resurrection, they do not marry or are given in marriage. And then he says, they are, and this is what is sometimes misunderstood, they are as the angels of God. So some might misinterpret that to mean that there is a dematerialization. That is not the context of the Lord's words. The Lord says that God is the God of the dead and God is God of the living and not of the dead. And since he identifies, God identifies himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, they are not spoken of as those who don't exist anymore, but they live in him. So the promise of the resurrection of, of, of which Christ is the first fruits and we the later fruits is a transformed body, transformed body, a body that death cannot touch anymore. Christ being risen from the dead dies now no more. Or to use the, the expression of the scripture scholar N.T. Wright, a transphysicalized body, not an anti-physicalized body, but a transphysicalized body. So that is the focus of St. Ephraim's hymns on paradise. Back to paradise. Where do we first encounter paradise? Well, we encounter it in the book of Genesis in the account of creation, where, according to the Septuagint text, which remains the, the standard text of the church, we are told that the Lord planted a paradise. Now, this in the, from, in our, the, in our translations that we are most familiar with, this gets rendered as garden, but uh, that's not the word that's used in the Septuagint, the Lord planted a paradise, which is a more precise word than, than simply a garden. It's, it's uh, an, enclosed, an enclosed garden, a world unto itself. And this is what St. Ephraim has in mind when he speaks of paradise, or rather it's the first aspect of it, that this realm that God has prepared, we might, the next question we might ask is when does God create paradise? Because with the creation of man, paradise already there in, in Genesis. St. Ephraim assumes that paradise is not some sort of phenomenon in chronological time. And of course, we uh, might react to that saying, oh, then he means that it's kind of an imagination. No, he doesn't mean that at all. He means that there are other dimensions of time rather than the chronological. There is sacred time and sacred space. And it's in sacred time and sacred space that paradise exists. And in fact, uh, sacred time and sacred space have a quality of endurance that surpasses that of chronological time and measurable space. So this realm of paradise and another one of the focuses of St. Ephraim is that the temple in Jerusalem, we would have to say specifically Solomon's temple, the temple that Solomon built, the one that was filled with the glory of God, described several times that way, uh, which is succeeded by the church in the New Testament. These are all 
foreshadowings of paradise, the temple and the church. And in what sense does the, in, in what dimension does the temple and the church exist? Well, there's of course a difference between the two, but in order to understand the place of the temple before it gets destroyed in Israel is the temple is the place where heaven and earth meet. The temple is the threshold between time and eternity. Just as in time, the Sabbath in Israel is the entry of eternity into time and the partaking of the rest of God, not simply non-activity, but the rest of God who in the interior life of the Trinity, the perichoresis of the three persons of the Trinity lives in this rest. From this rest proceeds creation and then creation is called back to the rest. And unfortunately, uh, that re-entry of the creation into the rest of God requires the cooperation of the free will of man and um, uh, our first parents were not willing to give that and so they were deprived of the rest so all of those promises of the rest to come you you in the in the uh latin rite begin the divine office every day with psalm 94 which ends with uh, uh rather dire words that they shall never enter into my rest. Uh, but of course, the letter to the Hebrews quotes that and says there remains the rest of God, the Sabbath rest for the people of God. So that participation in the rest of God, that is what is central to the life of paradise. Now, St. Ephraim, I'm not going to turn directly to the text yet, but, but uh, St. Ephraim describes paradise in a way that does make it, does establish a relationship between it and the temple and the church. So I want to find a passage here that's not in your text, but... Uh, the sense that he, yeah, here it is. This is again from the introduction of Sebastian Brock's translation of the Hymns on Paradise. The location of this paradise envisaged as a mountain, a mountain, so is the temple, by the way, it's on the, the Mount Zion, was variously expressed. Genesis 2.8, the Lord God planted a paradise in Eden in the east. From the point of view of St. Ephraim's conception of paradise is an interpretation given to these words that are, which are found in the Syriac translation of the Bible with which he would have been familiar. And this says that the Lord planted paradise from the beginning, from the beginning, that is belonging to sacred time. A garden had been planted in Eden for the just by the word of the Lord God before the creation of the world. And he made Adam reside there once he had created him. Now, St. Ephraim proceeds from that paradise to speak of a word, by the way, that is used very rarely. And the next time we find St. Ephraim using it is in regard to the Lord's use of it on the cross. When he says to the thief, this day you shall be with me in paradise. And that, of course, has led to all sorts of uh, speculations and, either, and even confusions as to how such a thing can be. Because 
people try to superimpose upon it all sorts of dogmatic and chronological formulae, and they don't work very well. Uh, so people ask us questions, well, how can, how can Jesus our Lord say that today the thief will be with him in paradise when he is on the cross? He doesn't even say tomorrow. He says, today you'll be with me in paradise. When chronologically that day he's in this world on the cross, the next day he's going to be in the tomb. And the following day, the third day, he shall rise. How does the thief being in paradise fit into all of this? Well, again, this is, this is mystical and sacred time. And I, I stress, I don't, I don't mean, therefore, that it's, that it's fanciful. It has a reality that is stronger even than the measurable realities. Thus, for example, the, the Byzantine tradition in her liturgical texts expresses the mystery with words such as these, speaking, speaking in regard to the Lord. You are in the tomb with the body, in paradise with the thief, in, in Hades with the soul as God, and on the throne with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Now there you have a text to contemplate, you see. You're in the tomb with the body, in Hades with the soul as God, in paradise with the thief, and on the throne with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And we, so we like to try to put a, a, you know, a chronological template on that and understand it formulaically. You can't, you can't. It's like an exa another example of it would be when Jesus speaks to Nicodemus, at least as it is recorded in the received text of the gospel. I'm not talking about contemporary translations, but in the received text. Jesus says to Nicodemus, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who has come down from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven. That is to say that Jesus says to Nicodemus, I am in heaven now, while he is speaking with Nicodemus, you see. So we cannot uh, impose upon this description of paradise, some sort of easy formula. This paradise that the thief will we'll look at St. Ephraim's own words in, in the hymn just shortly. The paradise that the thief is invited to and, and he's told that he will be with Jesus there. What is it? Is it simply a return to the paradise of Adam and Eve? Well, it's not quite so simple as that. Many of you will be familiar with the text that is read uh, in the Latin rite. It's read in the Office of Readings on Holy Saturday. But in the Byzantine rite, it's also read on Holy Saturday if you do the entire service. And it's not called the anonymous homily. This in here is my uh, copy of the Latin rite the liturgy of the hours, and it says from an ancient homily on Holy Saturday. If you look in the Byzantine books, it's uh, ascribed to Saint Epiphanius, Bishop of Salamis on Cyprus, another fourth century figure, quite a character. He was a uh, kind of treasure trove of all kinds of of ancient and obscure knowledge. Uh, especially about things in the Old Testament. St. John Chrysostom had a, had a nickname for him that sounded rather like one of the uh, titles of Charles Dickens' novels, The Old Curiosity Shop. <laughs> but nevertheless, he was the author of many wonderful homilies. And uh, this is what the Lord is described as saying to Adam when the Lord is in Hades, the dimension of the dead, he says to Adam, rise, let us leave this place. The enemy led you out of the earthly paradise. I will not restore you to that paradise, but I will enthrone you in heaven. So here we have reference to heaven, a paradise that is beyond the former paradise. I forbade you the tree that was only a symbol of life, but see, I who am life itself am now one with you. I appointed cherubim to guard you as slaves are guarded, but now I make 
them worship you as God. The throne formed by the cherubim awaits you, its bearer swift and eager. The bridal chamber is adorned, the banquet ready, the eternal dwelling place is prepared, the treasure houses of all good things lie open. The heavenly kingdom has been prepared for you from all eternity. So that is a, a way of speaking of the paradise. In addition to that, of course, Para Ephraim in his hymns loves to speak of the two trees, the two trees of the first paradise. And he speaks of them in a, in a uh, very particular way. We often even get confused and, and, act, and speak as if there's only one tree. We, we uh, you know, we uh, read the account in the book of Genesis that there's two trees in the garden, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then we get confused because then the story doesn't mention the tree of life again until you get to the end when Adam and Eve are driven out and they don't have access to it. And then the tree of life reappears in the book of the apocalypse, the revelation at the end of it, so that you have the tree of life scripturally in the first and last books of Holy Scripture, kind of like bookends. So Ephraim's description of the two trees is he says that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil overshadowed or sheltered the tree of life. In other words, to get to the tree of life, you had to get past the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he says, as do many of the fathers, that the Lord God forbids Adam and Eve to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil <clears throat> because they were not ready for it. Uh, like especially there's a, there's a kind of theological kinship between St. Ephraim the Syrian and St. Gregory of Nyssa, who speak of our being created in the image and likeness of God. The image is of our essence, our being, but the likeness is something that we have to grow into, we have to become. And of course, we will only become, according to the likeness, by the use of our free will in the way that God has destined for us. But if we resist that, then the growing in the likeness becomes blocked. So this is what happens to Adam and Eve. And they can't get past after they unlawfully, in, in disobedience, uh, in, in an attempt to self-deify. They are, are deceived by the serpent and, and eat the fruit of the tree that's not intended for them. So they can't get past that tree to the tree of life, which is in its shadow. That's how St. Ephraim presents it. Until, until the access to it is provided. And that access is provided, of course, by the passion and death of the Lord. Thus. Uh, we read in the uh, Byzantine text for the Matins of Good Friday, through a tree, Adam lost his home in paradise, and through the tree of the cross, the thief made paradise his home. For the one by eating transgressed the commandment of his maker, but the other crucified at your side confessed you as God, and remember us also, O Savior, in your kingdom. Then, then a further verse goes on to say, your life-giving side, O Christ, flowing as a fountain from Eden, waters your church as a living paradise. Then dividing into the four branches of the gospels with its streams, it refreshes the world, making glad the creation and teaching the nations to venerate your kingdom with faith. Now, from that introduction, let's turn to the text itself. Um, and we'll begin with the first hymn. So if you're using the uh, text that has been provided, uh, this, this is the opening part of the first of the 15 hymns on paradise. 
remember, of course, that I'm doing Ephraim's hymnody and an injustice because I'm not singing it. These, these texts are not really meant to be read as prose. They're meant to be sung. And I understand that there are a very few places that claim to have passed down through the centuries the melodies that were used at the time of St. Ephraim when the hymns were written, but I, I cannot attempt that. So Ephraim begins this way. Moses, who instructs all men with his celestial writings, he, the master of the Hebrews, has instructed us in his teaching. The law, which constitutes a very treasure house of revelations, wherein is revealed the tale of the garden, described by things visible, but glorious for what lies hidden, Sp spoken of in few words, yet wondrous in its many plants. So Ephraim speaks of what is visible and what is hidden. He's referring to the tree of life, hidden behind the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then he goes on to say that this is a, I think this is the phrase that was used to uh, uh, give a name to this talk tonight. I took my stand halfway between awe and love. It's an interesting way of expressing, uh, you know, uh, in, the, in the Byzantine liturgy, the people are summoned to communion with the words, with the fear of God, with faith and with love, draw near. Uh, and none of those things are seen in being in opposition to each other. Here St. Ephraim says, he takes his stand between awe and love. A yearning for paradise invited me to explore it, but awe at its majesty restrained me from my search. With wisdom, however, I reconciled the two. I revered what lay hidden and meditated on what was revealed. The aim of my search was to gain profit. The aim of my silence was to find succor, help. Now, another aspect of St. Ephraim's approach, and in general, the approach of the Syrian fathers, and we must place Ephraim within his context, that the experience of God in the writings of the Syrian fathers and in St. Ephraim's hymns is one that on the one hand, remember that this is taking place at the same time as the Aryan controversy and the Aryan controversy has to be fought as much in Syria as it does in Egypt and in, and in Constantinople and the West. So Ephraim is involved in this controversy and makes it very clear that for Arius to put, as, as he would say, to put Jesus on the creation side of things makes it impossible to know Jesus as he is, because Jesus, of course, is the name given to the eternal Son of God, who in his divine eternity lives not on the creation side of things, but on the creator side of things in that, in that sense. So you cannot, on the one hand, speak of, of the Son of God as a creature, as like Arius did. And in the same way, there are those things that are hidden from us. Uh, and St. Ephraim affirms that frequently in the words of his hymns, that we are not to pry into things that we have no business to ask. So there, are, there is that dimension of what has not been revealed to us, what has been revealed, what has not been revealed, and we need to distinguish between the two. So that's why his expression between awe and love, uh, invited to explore, but restraint for awe at its majesty. Then he goes on to say, third stanza, joyfully did I embark on the tale of paradise, a tale that is short to read, but rich to explore. My tongue read the story's outward narrative, 
while my intellect took wing and soared upward in awe as it perceived the splendor of paradise, not indeed as it really is, but insofar as humanity is granted to comprehend it. So there is the known and the unknown, what we are able to comprehend. And just as the fathers of the church are in consensus that there is the dimension of God in his divine nature that is always beyond us, even though the, the mystery, the, the paradox, that we are invited to become partakers of the divine nature as creatures. We are invited, St. Peter says, to be partakers of the divine nature. Yet, what we are invited to become partakers of is always going to be beyond us. And instead of that uh, posing an intellectual conundrum for us, that perhaps is the source of the awe and wonder of paradise, that we shall partake of a life that remains ineffable for us, indescribable. Then he goes on to say, with the eyes of, stanza four, with the eyes of my mind, I gazed upon paradise. The summit of every mountain is lower than its summit. The crest of the flood reached only its foothills. So describing paradise in relationship to the flood of, at the time of Noah, the flood that wiped out everything on earth in the, in the, creation, in the uh, Genesis account. But here, St. Ephraim speaks of it poetically as reaching only its footholds, the crest of the uh, foothills, the crest of the flood. These, these it, namely the flood, kissed with reverence before turning back. To rise above and subdue the peak of every hill and mountain, the foothold of paradise it kisses, while every summit it buffets. And then the final stanza that I will read from this first of the hymns says, not that the ascent to paradise is arduous because of its height, for those who inherit it experience no toil there. Those who inherit it will have the rest of God. With its beauty, it joyfully urges on those who ascend amidst glorious rays that lies resplendent, all fragrant with its scents, Magnificent clouds fashion the abodes of those who are worthy of it. So notice the juxtaposition, we might say, of, on the one hand, the most beautiful expressions that appeal to our senses. No, no allergy to the beauty of, of visible creation here, on the one hand. But on the other hand, also how St. Ephraim conveys that all that can be said about it in this way does not describe it as it really is. One, one might think of um, an example that might be more, more familiar to us. You know, uh, St. Bernadette had the, the vision of uh, Our Lady at Lourdes and then uh, various artists tried to, uh, to capture it. And Bernadette, was, when she was shown these things, was generally very displeased with them. She said, no, it wasn't like that at all. So there is, on, on the one, she wasn't like that at all, Bernadette said. So on the one hand, the physicality, we might say, but the trans physicality. Now, uh, let's turn ahead to the third hymn, or you probably don't have to turn, I have to turn. And this, if I, I think we'll have time, I want to read and, and comment in its totality because it's about the trees and our first parents. So it begins, as for that part of the garden, my beloved, which is situated so gloriously at the summit of that height where dwells the glory, not even its symbol can be depicted in man's thought. For what mind has the sensitivity to gaze upon it 
or the faculties to explore it, or the capacity to attain to that garden whose riches are beyond comprehension. Perhaps that blessed tree, the tree of life, is by its rays the sun of paradise. Its leaves glisten, and on them are impressed the spiritual graces of that garden. In the breezes, the other trees bow down as if in worship before that sovereign and leader of the trees. So the tree, uh, I, I, of course, I, I'm, I'm a lover of the writings of J.R.R. Tolkien. And I think of the trees that he describes in the Silmarillion, the, the trees of light, the one is as, as the sun and the moon of, of the blessed realm. So here, uh, Ephraim describes the tree of life as, as the sun of the garden. Incidentally, the, uh, just as a short aside, Ephraim's hymnography in Syriac, much of it was translated into Greek during his lifetime, during his lifetime, not afterwards. So it became familiar to a much larger number of, of Christians, the, the Greek church, and even, even to some in the Latin tradition, for example, in the Greek tradition, Romanos de Melodis, the composer of the great Kantakia, and St. Ambrose in the West were encouraged in their respective Greek and Latin hymnography by the translation of St. Ephraim's hymns. And uh, well, I'll, I'll show you, or I'll read to you, uh, when I finish this, some uh, echoes of St. Ephraim's hymns in Greek hymnography. So the tree of life is the leader of the trees. In the, in the very midst, he planted the tree of knowledge, endowing it with awe, hedging it in with dread, so that it might straightway serve as a boundary to the inner region of paradise. Two things did Adam hear in that single decree. They should not eat of it, and that by shrinking from it, they should perceive that it was not lawful to penetrate further beyond that tree. In St. Ephraim's commentary on the book of Genesis, he says that the tree of knowledge serves as the sanctuary veil served in the temple. That the tree of knowledge protects the tree of life as the sanctuary veil protected the holy of holies. That you cannot, you cannot pass beyond it, as in the temple, for example, only the high priest could pass beyond it once a year. So in that sense, the temptation in the fall is, is that Adam and Eve violate the sacredness of paradise. The serpent could not enter paradise, stanza four, for neither animal nor bird was permitted to approach the outer region of paradise. And Adam had to go out to meet them. So the serpent cunningly learned through questioning Eve, the character of paradise, what it was and how it is ordered. When the accursed one learned how the glory of that inner tabernacle, as if in a sanctuary, was hidden from them, and that the tree of knowledge clothed with an injunction served as the veil for the sanctuary, he realized that its fruit was the key of justice that would open the eyes of the bold and cause them great remorse. So to, in an unauthorized manner, uh, play around with the tree of knowledge and the fruit, its fruits is the, the key of justice. It's, it's a bitter knowledge that Adam and Eve obtained from taking the fruit that is not theirs. Their eyes were open, sixth stanza, though at the same time they were still closed so as not to see the glory of their own low estate, so as not to see the glory of that inner tabernacle, nor to see the nakedness of their own bodies. These two kinds of knowledge God hid in the tree, placing it as a judge between the two parties. But when Adam boldly ran and ate of its fruit, this double knowledge straightway flew toward him, tore away and removed both veils from his eyes, he beheld the glory of the holy of holies and trembled. He beheld to his own shame and blush, groaning and lamenting, because the twofold knowledge he had gained had proved for him a torment. 
knowledge as torment, a knowledge that was not intended for him, at least at that time, he was not ready for it. Whoever has eaten of that fruit either sees and is filled with delight, or he sees and groans out. The serpent incited them to eat in sin so that they might lament, having seen the blessed state they could not taste of it. Like that hero of old whose torment was doubled because in his hunger he could not taste the delights which he beheld. Now, I think I will go ahead a little bit for reasons of time. Let's go to stanza 10. God established the tree as judge so that if Adam should eat from it, it might show him that rank which he had lost through his pride and show him as well that low estate he had acquired to his torment. Whereas if he should overcome and conquer, it would robe him in glory and reveal to him also the nature of shame so that he might acquire in his good health an understanding of sickness. So the robe of glory that Adam is deprived of and left in his nakedness, and then later on the sorry garments of fig, of fig leaves and then skins that instead of the robe of glory. Stanza 12, had Adam conquered, he would have acquired glory upon his limbs and discernment of what suffering is so that he might be radiant in his limbs and grow in his discernment. But the serpent reversed all this and made him taste abasement in reality and glory in recollection only so that he might feel shame at what he had found and weep at what he had lost. So instead of gain, it is lost. The tree was to him like a gate, its fruit was the veil covering that hidden tabernacle. Adam snatched the fruit, casting aside the commandment when he beheld that glory within, shining forth with its rays, he fled outside. He ran off and took refuge among the modest fig trees. And then finally, we are in stanza 15, even though all the trees of paradise are clothed each in its own glory, yet each veils itself at the glory. So each tree has its own glory, but veils itself at the glory. The seraphs with their wings, the trees with their branches, all cover their faces so as not to behold their Lord. They all blushed at Adam, who was suddenly found naked. The serpent had stolen his garments, for which it was deprived of its feet. And then finally, Ephraim concludes this hymn by saying, God did not permit Adam to enter that innermost tabernacle. This was withheld so that first he might prove pleasing in his service of the outer tabernacle. So Adam must learn how to serve outside. And thus, outside paradise, he is exiled with Eve. And the flaming sword as another veil uh, guards the way to the tree of life. Like a priest with fragrant incense, Adam's keeping of the commandment was to be his censer, that he might enter before the hidden one and into that hidden tabernacle. And then the hymn concludes with St. Ephraim saying that all of this is an image of the two sanctuaries in the temple, the Holy of Holies, where the high priest only enters, and the holy place. The symbol of paradise was depicted by Moses who made the two sanctuaries, the sanctuary and the Holy of Holies. Into the outer one entrance was permitted, but into the inner only once a year. So too with paradise, God closed off the inner part, but he opened up the outer wherein Adam might graze. So Adam is not rejected. He is allowed as it were to graze in the outer sanctuary until the time has come when he will have access to the inner one, the tree of life, which has prepared for him, but the untimely eating of the fruit has obstructed this. Now, in the Byzantine hymnography that we sing before Lent from the Lenten Triodion, you can 
hear echoes of Ephraim's hymns in the Byzantine hymns. Uh, so on the Sunday, uh, the last Sunday before Lent, Forgiveness Sunday, we have uh, these words in Matins for Forgiveness Sunday. Banished from the joys of paradise, Adam sat outside and wept, and beating his hands upon his face, he said, I am fallen in your compassion, have mercy on me. O paradise, share in the sorrow of your master who is brought to poverty, and with the sound of your leaves, pray to the creator that he may not keep your gate closed forever. I am fallen in your compassion, have mercy on me. And then in another place for that same Sunday, for Vespers, Adam was cast out of paradise through eating from the tree. Seated before the gates, he wept, lamenting with a pitiful voice and saying, woe is me, what have I suffered in my misery? I transgressed one commandment of the master, and now I am deprived of every blessing. O most holy paradise, planted for my sake and shut because of Eve, pray to him that made you and fashioned me that once more I may take pleasure in your flowers. Then the Savior said to him, I do not desire the loss of the creature which I fashioned, but that he should be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. And when he comes to me, I will not cast him out. So always is emphasized the desire of God to save. God who does not discard his fallen creature created in his image, who has failed to attain his likeness. That is so central. I think one of the greatest consolations of this Paschal season is when we consider the condition of the apostles who are broken and, fa and have failed the Lord. They don't witness his crucifixion except for St. John. They have hidden themselves away. And we might expect the risen and triumphant Lord simply to discard them as unworthy. But in fact, he does not do so. He recreates them. He breathes on them. He says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. They have not witnessed the crucifixion, yet by the power of the resurrection and being recreated in the Holy Spirit through the breath of God, they will go out in the joy of the resurrection and be able to endure the cross for the sake of the love of the Lord. Now, uh, I want to turn finally to the eighth hymn. I only read, I think, excerpts from it because here we have words of the restoration. Here we are. There came to my ear from the scripture which had been read a word that caused me joy on the subject of the thief. It gave comfort to my soul amidst the multitude of its vices, telling how he had compassion on the thief Oh, may he bring me too into that garden, at the sound of whose name I am overwhelmed in joy. My mind bursts its reins as it goes forth to contemplate him. Then there's the response that would have been sung as a refrain to the hymn, Hold me worthy that we may become heirs in your kingdom. I behold a dwelling there in the tabernacle of light, a voice proclaiming, Blessed is the thief who has freely received the keys to paradise. I imagined that he was already there, but then I considered how the soul cannot have perception of paradise without its make the body, its instrument and lyre. So the body is the mate of the soul. In this place of joy's anguish seized me as I realized that it is not profitable to delve into hidden things with respect to the thief. A dilemma beset me. If the soul were able to see and to hear without its body, why then is it confined therein? And if the body is no longer alive, why should the soul be put to death with it? So Ephraim ponders the separation of soul and body, which is not natural for us, not according to our destiny. 
that the soul cannot see without the body's frame, the body itself persuades, since if the body becomes blind, the soul is blind in it. Groping about with it, see how each looks and attests to the other, how the body has need of the soul in order to live, and the soul too requires the body in order to see and to hear. If the body grows deaf, the soul does too, and it grows delirious while the body reels with sickness. Though the soul exists of itself and for itself, yet without its companion, it lacks true existence. It fully resembles an embryo still in the womb whose existence is at yet bereft of word or thought. If the soul while in the body resembles an embryo and is unable to know either itself or its companion, how much more feeble will it then be once it has left the body, no longer possessing on its own the senses which are able to serve as tools for it to use? For it is through the senses of its companion that it shines forth and becomes evident. That blessed abode is in no way deficient, for that place is complete and perfected in every way, and the soul cannot enter there alone. For in such a state, is, it is in everything deficient, in sensation and consciousness. But on the day of resurrection, the body with all its senses will enter in as well, once it has been made perfect. When the hand of the creator fashioned and formed the body so that it might sing hymns to its maker, this liar was silent and had not voice until at last he breathed into it the soul which sang therein. Thus the strings acquired sound and the soul by means of the body acquired speech to utter wisdom. When Adam was in all things complete, then the Lord took him and placed him in paradise. The soul could not enter there of itself and for itself. But together they entered body and soul, pure and perfect, to that perfect place. And together they left it once they had become solid. From all this, we should learn that at the resurrection, they will enter again together. Adam was heedless as guardian of paradise, for the crafty thief stealthily entered. Leaving aside the fruit which most men would covet, he stole instead the garden's inhabitant. Adam's Lord came out to seek him. He entered Sheol and found him there, then led and brought him out to set him once more in paradise. Thus, in the delightful mansions on the borders of paradise, do the souls of the just and righteous reside awaiting there the bodies they love, so that at the opening of the garden's gate, both bodies and souls might proclaim amidst hosannas, blessed is he who's brought, who has brought Adam from Hades and returned him to paradise in the company of the many. And I thought that that was especially a good place to conclude with St. Ephraim's proclamation of the promise of the resurrection and the reintegration of the person created in the image and likeness of God, which Saint Ephraim celebrates so beautifully in these hymns on paradise. Uh, Christ is risen. Indeed, he is risen. Wow, thank you so much, Father Anderson. Just a beautiful meditation on some beautiful hymns from Saint Ephraim. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. Very glad to do it. Father Anderson, are you ready for some sure. questions? All right. This one coming in anonym anonymously. Uh, what would St. Ephraim think about the, uh, the creation account? Would he have taken it literally as seven 24-hour periods? Now, of course, that's always a dangerous thing to claim to speak for somebody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, my... My intuition, that's all I can say, is that like so many others, uh, St. Basil, for example, comes to mind, uh, who write of the creation, and of course, St. Ephraim uh, expresses it, it through, through hymnody. I don't know as he would create an irresolvable tension between what we would call the literal and the mystical. I don't think that he would see them necessarily in the kind of same uh, uh, collision course that, that we've been conditioned to do by, 
by I think some of the more uh, unfortunate efforts of contemporary scripture scholarship, which, by the way, I, I, I have had plenty of formation in, in modern scripture scholarship, and I'm grateful for a great deal of it. I'm not in any way dismissing it. But on, on the one hand, on the other hand, I think it maybe is uh, uh, something that, if it's possible, should be seen not as an irresolvable paradox, the, the, the literal and the, uh, the mystical or the however you want to describe the other sense of scripture. Certainly, we can say this, certainly St. Ephraim would not limit his, his understanding and interpretation of not only the creation account, but everything else, even about those things of which there is no question that there is a, a literal historical sense that is easily identified. St. Ephraim, with, with, along with uh, the bulk of the fathers of the fourth century and even a, a, a longer period of time, would say that's fine, but that's only the beginning of, under, of the understanding. You have, to, you have to have your understanding opened as the two disciples did on the road to Emmaus. Uh, when we're told that that the Lord Jesus risen from the dead opened their understanding so that they might comprehend the scriptures and he did that for his apostles too. So uh, the perhaps perhaps then what I'm trying to convey is that the the uh, energy behind that question is it. Is it really seven 24 hours, hour days uh, or six uh, 24 hour days? Uh, perhaps that was not even so much an issue for the Holy Fathers. I guess, I, I guess that would be my, my attempt. Very interesting. Um, Caroline asks, so is it safe to say that Adam entered God's kingdom? Oh yes, oh yes, yes. Uh, certainly, certainly, that is assumed uh, in uh, all of of uh, the liturgical expressions of of uh, Holy Saturday, especially in in the Eastern churches. But you also find uh, expressions of it in the in the Latin tradition as well, uh, hymnographically. Uh, that that there is the restoration of Adam, and icon iconographically, of course the central image we call it in the in the byzantine tradition the icon of the resurrection but it's not uh, it's not an image of of the lord jesus coming forth from the tomb which nobody saw the stone is rolled away not to let him out but to show that he's not there and nobody witnesses it people do witness his appearing to them but nobody witnesses the moment of the resurrection. And likewise, the death of the Lord as his entrance, that of course it's called the descent of, into Hades, the harrowing of hell, so forth. Uh, and all of these are ways to express, I think, again, the ineffable, that in that going to the state, the condition, the dimension where God is not, God is not in death. The dead cannot praise the Lord, says the psalm, or anyone that goes down into Hades. To not have the faculty to praise the Lord, that's the condition of the dead in the language of the Old Testament. So there, or, or the bottomless pit also. When the Son of God goes to be the bottom of the bottomless pit, mm -hmm. uh, what he finds there is finally his long lost Adam. Mm -hmm. So beautiful. Yeah, and that's of course, uh, that's I'm just taking directly from the, from the Byzantine liturgical text, you know, uh, not finding, uh, this is sung at the Matins of Holy Saturday at the tomb in, in the Byzantine tradition. Uh, from heaven you came to earth to seek Adam who was lost and not finding him, you went to Hades to find him there. Hmm. And as I saw you have a question, go ahead and take yourself off of mute. In paradise, there's the um, 
the tree of life. In chronological time, we have the cross. In paradise, there's the, the book, the tree of knowledge. What would, what would be the equivalent? What do we have the, in chronological time? Is it of, of the tree of knowledge? That's a, that's a very interesting question. And I don't know offhand how exactly I would answer that. I think here is, here is how it seems to me. The, the tree of knowledge, uh, and of course, remember that the full name is the tree of knowledge of good and evil, after it has been misused by the, by the first parents is not spoken of again. Now, does that mean that it kind of fades away? To that question, I don't know. However, the tree of life, the, the final word on the tree of life, I mean, certainly this is the, this is the venue to, to hear it. The final word on the tree of life is from the conclusion of the book of Revelation, where uh, in Revelation 22, uh, John says, then he showed me the river of the water of life, right as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the lamb through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life. On both sides of the river of life, the tree of life. <laughs> there's, a, there's an ineffable image for you. Uh, we, uh, see, you can't, you, you can't box these into the limitations of a time and space. You can't say, mm, one tree, one side, that's the way it works. Uh, da, 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 da. No, it doesn't, not anymore. <laughs> tree of life can be on both sides of the river, just as there doesn't need to be any sun, S-U-N, in the, in the city of God, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the sun. Uh, so, uh, and, and then, of course, the, the words that we love so much, there shall be no more anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall worship him. They shall see his face. That's the desire that is always postponed, always postponed. Uh, God says no to Moses. You can't see my face and live. And that's after we're told that Moses and God spoke face to face. Then we're told that Moses can't see his face. Again, it's this, this paradox that, that we cannot, that's, that's what I was getting at with talking about a literal and, and uh, mystical meaning. Uh, we, can't, we, we just can't say, oh, it's got to be one or the other. It's both and, both and. Thank you. We'll close out with this one, Father Anderson. Tanya asks, what is God's rest? Oh, hmm. well, before I try to say something, I would, I would recommend to you, if you, if you really wish to, to, uh, to read something that has been very helpful to me, and I was directed to read it by, by Father Schmemann, read the book by Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, called the Sabbath. It's a little book and it's not a, it's not a, you know, a book for a quote professional theologian. It's not a difficult book to read, read it. And then uh, what he says there, I'll just try to, in a, in a very short few words, try to sum it up. He reflects that as, as the, the fathers, of course, a Rabbi, Rabbi Heschel is an Orthodox Jew. So uh, yet he has a sensitivity for, for Christians. But he says, what does, God finishes his creation on the sixth day. That's clear. It's finished on the sixth day. So what happens on the seventh day? God reveals his rest. And whereas the creation is a revelation of what God does. God creates, not because he's compelled to, but as a overflowing of his love. But God's rest is the revelation of who God is. So if, if the creation is in the realm of doing, the rest is in the realm of being. Martha and Mary, the sisters of Lazarus, you know, their famous gospel. Uh, Martha is into doing. Mary is into being. And so 
in the end, the better part, Mary has chosen that good part, says Jesus, and it will not be taken away from her. So that better part is to enter into the being, being with God and in God. That's the whole point of the conclusion of the book of Revelation on the reappearance of the tree of life and being in the city of God. What's, uh, what will be by, by God's mercy and grace and hopefully our cooperation with it, what, what, will be, what will we be able to say, I'm of course speaking kind of imaginatively now, uh, of, of, the, of our life in paradise? What's our address? Our address is God. Where do you live? With God. They shall see his face. Beautifully put. Father Anderson, thank you once again for this evening. It was just wonderful. I, my joy. My joy. Good to see you all. Those who I see, those who I don't see. Would you mind uh, closing us with a prayer and your blessing? I shall sing the Paschal hymn to the Mother of God. The angel cried to the lady full of grace, Rejoice, O pure virgin. And again I say rejoice. Your son is risen from his three days in the tomb. With himself he has raised all the dead. Rejoice, all you people. Shine, shine, O new Jerusalem. For the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Dance now and be glad, O Zion, and exult, O pure Theotokos, in the resurrection of your Son. God is with us through his grace and love for mankind, always, now, and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Amen. Christ is risen. Let's pray for one another. Absolutely. Indeed, he is risen. Thank you so much, Father Anderson. Thank you all for joining us this evening. We'll look forward to seeing you next time. Have a great night. God bless.